Oh, yeah. great. Oh, Tina's back. <laughs> well, we'll have to stay in touch if you'd like. For sure. Absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Okay, ladies, I'm so sorry about that. My connection just dropped out. So I'm back Don't now. Um, if I can ask you, you have... to mute. <laughs> yep. That's it. Thank 80. you. Fantastic. I, I'm assuming you all got to know each other in a few minutes yeah. that I was away. Great, great. Yes. Okay, Becky. So um, you were talking about the business plan. I was just about to ask if you found that useful. Um, I have yet to really dive in. I plan to do okay. that soon. Okay. Um, and like I, I was saying, I think when I lost you, I'm, I've just been purchasing things along the way. I do have everything from tables and chairs and napkins yeah. to the industrial fridge and freezer, you know, because my now friend who owned yeah. her business told me everything that she okay. had. Okay. So your so, question I, oh, was, let me just pull that up again. Sorry. I've lost the, uh, oh no, I've, I've actually lost the chat. So it was about just, just say the question again for me. So what was, what do you find in your experience, your vast experience, what the biggest challenge Challenges. was? Uh, there are many. It's not for like faint hearted, I must admit. Um, but I think getting a good team around you is absolutely critical because you can't do this on your own. Um, if you're looking at running a tea room, um, have you thought about how you're going to do that yet? Yes. I have my husband and my daughter wants to be a part of the journey as well. Okay. I was going to say three is the magic number. You would really want someone to focus on the food. You want someone else to focus on the management and you want someone else to focus on your guests. That's how Good. you basically divide up the labor. Um, Obviously, there's a lot um, of management to do as far as health and safety, um, the health department, um, all those rules and regulations, making sure that your food is safe and that your establishment is set up correctly for that yeah. side of things. And to be honest, that is quite onerous when you start. So make sure you give yourself a long runway before opening. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fact that it is family is good on one hand because you already know these people uh it's also bad because you already know these people so yeah. <laughs> um, it, it can be stressful because it will be all consuming and if it's all consuming across your whole family yeah uh so make sure you 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 have some kind of backup plan if you want to have a day off or your daughter wants to have a day off or heaven forbid somebody gets sick uh, because yeah. obviously, if you do have, say, sickness when you're running a restaurant, you can't work with food. So you do have yeah. to have a little bit of uh, additional help or um, some something on standby that can can kind of help you with that. But I would say that is the most challenging. Um, and then the next part is getting word out and getting enough people to come in and your marketing. And you My have to market. And you have to market all the time. I always yeah. say um, there's three things that you do in business. One is deliver to your customer. Two is keep your costs as low as possible. And three is market your little bottom off. Sorry. And they said something rude there. Uh, but, yeah, you just got to keep marketing uh, all the time. I keep do have two daughters. One of them uh -huh. is she is a video editor. Okay. And social media guru. Oh, cool. That's great. I've told her that I will pay her X number of dollars per week. Yeah. To take if care she can of keep that going. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I found was really helpful was uh, my kitchen crew. I would get them to um, do little mini videos of what they were bringing out of the oven every morning. So um, it's one thing to have someone doing that for you. But it's better to have something real that's happening in the tea room if you can. So yeah. that might be something to bear in mind um, if you can do that. But, yeah, that sounds good. Has that answered your question? Has that given you a bit of insight? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm glad I, I, it sounds like I've got a bit of a head start. I've had the health department come in a long time ago just to check things out. Um, I recently had a um, person from the uh, fire department come mm-hmm. in. So he did a walkabout because we'll be, I, I travel from this small town in Southern Ontario into Toronto every day. It's like a two hour drive. Sure. I want to start traveling from upstairs to downstairs. So yes. we'll live in the portion and, and run the tea house down. And we don't want to make it big. We just want to keep it, you know, 10, 11 tables. That's it. Right. Okay. In that case, I would say focus on doing events where you're booking out the whole space because that will give you better revenue than doing dribs and drabs. Yeah. Um even if it means, you know, once a month you're running a themed afternoon tea to get lots of different people, but for one event, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily just baby showers, bridal showers, birthday parties, which I think you should do, but also maybe once a month having a themed tea where, you know, you're inviting people to dress up. I don't know. It could be Bridgerton or Downton Abbey or Jane Austen, you know, pick a theme that means something to you, get people Mm -hmm. to dress up and then book that and you could if you're doing a themed event you can often charge another 10 15 dollars more than you would if it was just the afternoon tea service itself yeah so that's just a a thought good ideas okay i am actually going to be recording this folks so uh, i will send this out to you um so that you can capture this if you haven't managed to and i'm sorry about the false start there earlier okay um I've lost the chat completely with me popping out and coming back again. So if you could put your questions into the chat, ladies, then I'll, uh, I'll I'll pick those up as we go. And we may have some more people joining us as we go through the evening. I'm not sure if they will or not, but we'll see uh, where we go from there. Their question was about um, location, choosing location. Yes. Yes. I've got that now. So, uh, Antonio, let's uh, let's speak to you on that. Can uh, we? Uh, yeah, uh, Becky, can you uh, just mute yourself there, just so that we can? Uh, sure. Yeah, fantastic. That way, we don't get too much uh, background noise. Um, so, what parameters do you look for when choosing a location? Interesting question. This is my hardest part right now. <laughs> can I, I just say? <laughs> can I just say? There's three things to look out for. Okay. Location. 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 You know. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> what does that mean? Let's unpack that. What does that mean? It means now you're in the States. Is that correct? No, I'm actually in Canada as well. I'm in Canada. Al- okay. Alberta. Alberta. Okay. The other side think, of Ontario. <laughs> okay. I think this is going to apply as well. If you'd have been okay. in the UK, perhaps a little less so. Uh, but um, in Canada, I can see this being the same. It's all about where you are located in respect to walking traffic, walking traffic, do you know what I mean by that? That's actual pedestrian traffic walking past your shop. It needs to be in a retail area, not uh, a... um, residential area it's very difficult to market a residential area if you don't have actual foot traffic and you need parking that's the one definitely that's need the one. parking yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially your winters are going to be so cold and icy and snowy and I went to see a property when I was looking it took me two years to find the right property now, I'm not saying I didn't do anything in those two years because I was running farmers markets and building a um, a reputation in my area so that when I went, oh, now I have a location, I'd already got people following me. So that's some of those early days stuff that you can be doing. Um, but I went to see this particular location and uh, it was in a really cutesy town. In fact, it was one of the towns that I did my farmers markets in. And um, it was uh, across the street. And you walked, I think it was three or four stores down, round the corner, uh, and then obviously around the back of these stores, three or four stores on a, another little side road, and there was the parking lot. Nobody, nobody 
said that was a good location for me when I was asking the local community at the farmer's market. They went, there's no parking. I said, yeah, it's just around the back. No, no, they're not going to walk. They're not going to walk around there. And it was only like, you know, four buildings this way, one building this way and four buildings back. No, they won't do it. And it's like, why? And it's like, well, because when it's icy and snowy and you've got yeah. older generation people, yeah. they're not going to do it. That's so, what I thought. Yeah. Mm. So parking, I, that was such a big lesson for me. And it was such a cute little town it was in as well. It's like, yeah. And the property I ended up going for, in fact, each of the properties that I had had parking exactly outside, like either at the front or at the rear. Um. Yeah, so you've got to make sure it's got parking and okay. for enough cars as well. Because that was one of the criticisms we had was that we never had enough parking. So when we were full, it was more difficult. So yeah, parking is an absolute must. Okay. But I would also say a resi- don't go to a residential area, go to an, an existing retail. So you actually have like other shops nearby. Right. Okay. Is I always say yeah, help. Healthy competition is always good because my my spouse was like, well, no, that person's the cynical, but that's good because it brings people. It does. It gives right? people choices and, and competition is never yeah. a bad thing. I think people get Not. hung up with competition. In fact, I was doing a study, reading a study, and they were saying that if you are next to um, a Starbucks, it's one of the best places because Starbucks have done all the research and they've done all the foot traffic analysis and they're there because they're going to, you know, they're going to get the traffic. Um, so it's not a bad thing. If you go into a shopping mall, you do have to be a bit careful, though, because I think uh, in the malls that Starbucks is in, um, they have um, a caveat that says no other tea or coffee shop can go into that same mall. Right. It's one of those competitive uh, things. And because they're so big, they they can have the weight on that. So that's just something to be aware of but if it's in a um like a kind of cutesy town um where you don't really have the shopping mall environment I mean I I like the idea of a a period property but that was because my my business was um a British tea room so I wanted that whole kind of vibe going on um so um yeah parking is the most important Thank you, because that's been my biggest challenge. And, and that's the reason why I don't pick a lot of places. I'm like, no parking. I go, yeah. the majority, I mean, you get a lot of all ages, I'm sure. But I have been to a lot of tea rooms, obviously, just scouting. And you do see the a little bit of an older crowd, right? Like yeah. aunts and grandmas. And yeah. they're not, I mean, not going to walk. Yeah. They're not going to yeah. walk, till, you know. No, no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really impact your business in the wintertime. Yeah. Um, right. And it, it, I mean, the tea room business is fantastic because it is multi-generational. You'll have, you know, you have the children, you'll have the parents, you'll have the grandparents. Um, And and that's a great thing to be able to offer. But, yeah, it it can put a lot of people off if you have to walk anywhere at all. Um, Exactly. say if you've got walking traffic. And if it takes you two years, if it takes you three years, if it takes you four years, it's worth waiting for the right place because you can lose a lot of money if you're not in the right location. And I've had one location that lost me a lot of money. So I wouldn't recommend going down that road. Exactly. Has that been helpful? very helpful thank you so much that was a brilliant not a question problem. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem oh God, okay thank you Erin um if you're going to buy a business how do you evaluate the price for it oh my goodness me that is a jolly good question hmm do you want to give me a little bit of background on that Erin yeah so um I'm currently I just started as you know um so I am doing teas out of my home and then oh, I'm yeah. also like a mobile tea yes. experience. And um I've my real dream is to get to, to get a location. Sure. Um I talked to uh like the economic development person in my city just to kind of get an idea what's out there because there's also a lot of grants too. So I wanted oh. to see what what's available. And um what she said was well a lot of the ways that people get in is to buy a business Um, because um, basically the health department can take up to six months and you're paying rent during that time. So if you buy a a restaurant that's already permitted, 
it's kind of like a fast track. Yes. Uh, so coincidentally, um, across the street from my old work, um, this bakery is going for sale. Okay. And, um, not really, I don't really love the idea of buying their business because I don't want to do what they're doing. Yeah. But, um, I'm, I'm interested, but, um, I also felt like they priced it very, very high. Okay. Okay. That that's great. That gives me a lot of context. Thank you. Okay. So I did buy a bakery in one of my, mm-hmm. my ventures. Um, but what I would say is, um, Let's let's roll back a second. So if you if you um, don't buy a, what we call a going concern, a place that's already running as a restaurant or a bakery or something that you know already has the commercial kitchen is the important thing. If you can find a location that already has a commercial kitchen, then most of the work is done for you. If you go into um, let's say it's a residential style property, you've got to apply for change of use and the zoning and then you've got to fit the kitchen and then you oh I know more about grease traps than any woman should ever need to know about grease traps you know there's just so many rules and regulations and if you do go into a property that already has some of this set up for you it saves a huge amount of time now my criteria when I was looking was it had to have already got a commercial kitchen in there now I didn't care what the business was as long as the property itself had a commercial kitchen or at least the three base sink or at least the grease trap in there. Although having said that, I did end up putting one in. Um, But that's like the major part of the plumbing is getting your three base sink in there. So that was kind of like my minimum requirement. Um, And a property that had already been used to serve food, be it a bakery, a cafe, um, one of my properties was an ex sweet shop that um, served coffee. So it had like a little bit of a cafe kind of context to it. Um, but then if you're buying a restaurant, that could be too far to the other extreme. And I did look at one and it had uh, a deep fat fryer. It had, you know, all these ovens and grills and um, extractor fans and it was more than I needed. Mm -hmm. So the value of that to me wasn't as high, even though it had got more stuff in it. Do do you see what I'm saying? Because I was only going to be making sandwiches and baking. But then there's other properties I looked at where maybe uh, it had been used for making, and let's say it was used for making sweets, uh, candy, but it didn't have an extractor. Well, for me to put an extractor into a building, that was going to cost 10 grand. And it wouldn't be my extractor. It would be part of the building. What What's an extractor? You know, the um, is that what you call it? Yeah, the um, exhaust for taking Oh, okay, up, okay. Yeah, yeah. so it, it kind of, you know, sucks. And it, it's, um, it's ducting that goes into the ceiling. And, you know, these mm-hmm. things are hugely expensive. Um, now, as it happened, my major tea room already had uh, grandfathered in uh, some usage, and it did it did stop me from having a gas uh, stove, but I was able to have uh, a, a halogen stove. So that was, you know, that was kind of factored in. So there was some grandfathered in stuff that I was able to work with. But if you go into a, a, a location and have to put this um, uh, this ducting in to, to extract all the fumes, then it's a huge investment for, for a bit of property that you're never going to own. Unless, mm-hmm. of course, you go out and buy a property, which I wouldn't actually recommend. It's much better to rent, I think, than buy, unless you're going to live there, Becky. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, because you're going to need as much money as possible for your cash flow just to keep the business running, you're gonna need access to cash. So don't mm-hmm. use up all your money buying a business and buying all okay. this equipment that you probably don't need, is what I'm trying to say. So if you buy this bakery, for example, you, you're quite right, you, you're resistant to buy the bakery as an, a going concern because you're not going to be a bakery. You're not 
you don't want their clientele because mm-hmm. it's a different business because that's what happens when you buy a business you're not just buying the fixtures and the fittings and, and maybe even some stock you're buying the goodwill and the customer list if, effectively of that business but if you're going and doing a different business then maybe some of those customers aren't they're not really that valuable to you because it's a different thing that you're you're going to be doing Mm -hmm. so what I would say is if you come across a business that you kind of like the location all the other things hit but you don't actually want to buy the business you could put an offer into them for the assets does that make sense so you're not buying the bakery as a going concern where it's just going to seamlessly transition you're actually going to change the whole thing you're going to be putting more investment in. You're going to maybe be putting tables and chairs in, maybe remodeling a little bit. Um, but, you know, the baking oven, I quite like to have that. And, um, you know, the the walking fridge, yeah, that would be great. So then you come up with a price. And what I would do is look at what the new price is and then halve it. Okay. So if it's got like a baking oven, and um i don't know say it's a thousand pounds but sorry a thousand dollars you'd offer 500 okay. and, and then go through all the assets and and, and make them an offer because you know not they they will get more money if they can sell it as a whole business mm-hmm. but it's not it's not worth it to you if it's not the same business does that make sense no, absolutely. It's funny because um, I wasn't, this was before I decided to really start that I saw them, that they were going out of business and trying to sell it. And it seemed like they got a buyer that fell out. Yeah. Um, I'm not, it's a great location. It's, I won't say great, but it's, it's where I want to be, but yeah. it's not exactly the building isn't what doesn't hit all my bells and yeah. whistles. Um, so I, I think, I do think that they're asking a little bit too much. Yeah. Um, but but I also know that I don't want to run it the way that they've run it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just more interested in the, the location and, and the equipment. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a, that's a fair thing to want and not want and, 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 and the basis for a conversation. So you could quite easily say, yes, I'm interested, but I'm only interested in this and this. Are you open to have a conversation about it? Because if they've got nobody else in the running, you know, it's almost like you want, you're going to wait till they go out of business and then they are going to start flogging off all the, all the assets. <laughs> yeah. And that's going to and be And then perfect. it's, it's yeah. rented too. So I don't even know what that, you know, yeah. what that's going to look like as far as a lease and what they've yeah. Well, you can you could reach out to them. You can find out who the um, who the landlord is. Um, you can get you can ask them for a copy of the lease that they have. Bearing in mind, it may go up when when you check up. that often happens when you change lease e, that the lease or you know increases. They see that as an opportunity to increase the price, um, but it gives you an indication, and then you need to look through that contract. And if you need any help with that, just let me know. But um, yeah, it's it, it, it's worth having a conversation if it ticks some of the boxes. And it might be that, well, you know, I'm kind of interested. I'm not desperate. It's not what I really, really want. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's, a conversation and we can come. It's to hard because maybe. it's like it's on that main street, but it's also a very small place. Yeah, uh, because it ran as a bakery. So yes. I've been in there several times and thought, well, they don't need all this and I would move this. But it still ends yeah. up being smaller than, and I, it might be too small because uh, yeah. often people say, you know, we want to keep it small, and uh, you know, only want you know six tables. You can't make a living out of six tables. Um, yeah. You know, it's a different situation if you're if you're living in a space and this is a little bit of extra income and, and you're leveraging the space you live in. But if you're paying rent and you're paying for staff and you know all these other things, you need to have a place big enough. I would say. Th- you need to seat at least 30 people. Okay. That's good. Um, 50 is better. Um, okay. There's no way that you could get 50 people in this 
the space. Yeah, and it, you know, and if you can only see, you know, six people at a time, then that's not a business. If that is the model you want to go for, you know, okay. unless you want to have like lots of to go stuff, but part of a tea room is the experience of yeah. sitting down and experiencing the whole thing. So, okay, yeah, Thanks. does that help? It does. I, I mean, I, I like having a number. So knowing that, okay, 30 to 50, um, that's kind of where I was at anyway. Yeah. Um, can I ask another follow-up question? Yeah, go on. Because we have um, too many people on tonight. There, so there's another property that's in the kind of same area, but it's, but it's, um, a little bit further, mm -hmm. um, not further. It's one block, but, okay. um, it's, it's currently basically vacant with a small building on it. And I, it's been vacant for a long time. And so I've been looking into like, well, what was here before? I think it was an auto repair or something, but it had a little cafe connected to it. Oh, right. Um, and I'm in California and because I'm doing British Caribbean. Oh, okay. So I thought, what if, cause, um, there's a friend of mine who has a restaurant and she said next, because she opened during COVID, she said the next restaurant I have has to have outdoor seating, just has right. to, yeah. that's what everybody does out here. Everybody wants yeah. to. And so I thought about this little space because what if it was all outdoor? Like with that, I, there's nothing like that out here and it never rains. So how humid is it? It's not humid. It's a dry. Yeah. Okay. Because in, yeah. in Indiana, where I was, people would not sit outside because it was too bloody humid. So <laughs> yeah, although I would I would sit out happily, they wouldn't. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's that would that could possibly work. I mean, you're always going to want some people, I think, that want to be inside and not in the sun. But I suppose mm -hmm. it depends how you shade the space. Yeah. Okay. It's just something that, um, I, there, it just doesn't exist. And it would be a very cool, if, if there's a way to create some like awnings or overhangs that, but you're not actually inside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a place in Indiana, um, called Rick's boat yard and it was on, it was on the lake and they, they just had so much decking and they had awnings and, you were basically outside overlooking this lovely reservoir mm. and the boats would be out there. And so it was kind of an idyllic place. It wasn't a tea room. It was a, um, I suppose it would be a, like a, a fish restaurant. Um, but um, that was kind of cool. I must admit. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it might, might, it may work. It may work. Thank you. Okay, uh, if that's answered your questions there, Erin. Um, Antonia, you've got another question there. What's the average square footage for a place? Ooh. That's a really good question. Mm. I think it depends what you're going to do and how you're looking at setting things up. I mean, we started out with a really small kitchen. I mean, so small and we were doing all our in-house baking um and within six months we'd expanded into the other half of the building um it's amazing how if you're well organized how little space you need for the kitchen element but then you do need to have enough space so people aren't feeling too crammed in especially after covid a little bit of space to kind of get around so i, I don't know what um I'd have to come back to you on that. I'd have to have a look at the contract that I had for my uh, tea room to see what the square footage was on that 50-seater um, space that I was talking about. I can't remember off the top of my head what that would be. So let me, uh, let me make a note of that. Um, I've got... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think what it was now. I've got some numbers that are kind of going around in my head, but I, I, I don't want to give you a, a false uh, a false start on that. Um, but yeah, you do need to think about making sure you've got enough space. I mean, what we did in, in our tea room, we, we actually had two. So we had, we had four top tables. So they were kind of like oblong. 
So you'd fit four people per oblong table. And then we put three of those together. So you have four, eight, 12 people. And then we have two rows of those. So that's probably your best configuration um, for getting groups in. And groups is where you make the money. So that means when we first opened, when we only had the 30 seats, we couldn't do group bookings. We just didn't have enough room. But when we expanded and we added these extra 24 seats, um, 24, yeah, 12, 24, yeah, those extra 24 seats, 24, 25, it's a really good number for baby showers and bridal showers. Um, and we were doing two table turns uh, on a Saturday. I and mean, then we'd maybe do one or two on a Sunday. Um, and one party would be like, a whole Saturday's taking. So it was like having four Saturdays crammed into a weekend. So that's where you make the money, not Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but the weekends. So um, I don't know if that helps. Okay. So out of the 11 that said they wanted to come on tonight, you are the, the lucky three that uh, actually meant it. So good luck there and, and well done there for being so dedicated. Um, I'm going to signpost you over to um, tearoomsecrets.com. I don't know if you've all been there yet and had a little poke around what we've got there. Um, but what I've done is as people have moved through the process of starting to actually getting their tea room to then getting staff on board, you'll start to see then some, some of it is training, some of it is actual documentation that you might need for um, your tea room. So there's something on hiring. In fact, let me just pull this up so I'm not doing it from memory. Um, hang on a second. Of course, my computer froze earlier and I've lost everything that I had open and prepared. So let me just, um, let me just pop over there. Um, so that's basically how I have kind of developed this whole training thing. We are doing a monthly group coaching. So if you found today helpful and you want to do more of this, I do make a small charge for that, $59 a month. Um, but then you get access and share all the goodies that we've shared today. We have got the business plan. Um, and then... There's a couple of other things on here that I just wanted to point to. So we have an equipment list and a vendor list. Now, the vendor list is U.S. based. So if you're in Canada, that's not necessarily going to work, but it does give you an indication um, of what's required. I've got job descriptions for tea room owners that that can help when you're starting to hire people. Staff handbooks for when you actually have employees and you have that responsibility. So I've, I've, all the stuff that I created through Tina's Traditional and the tea rooms that I had in the US there, I've got those documents which I, I share. And then you can see exactly how to use them. So in a way, they're better than a template. Um, but it actually shows you this is how to this is how it looks. And then you can modify it and edit it accordingly. So there's some really good juicy stuff in there, but you don't necessarily need it all in one go. You have a question. Oh, she's off. She's gone. Um Okay, so has anyone got any questions at all for me about the training or the coaching going forward? I have a question. Just wondering, sure. Uh, sure. do I do we just go in and sign up for the monthly meetings? Or like yeah, just sign up for that. Right. And I, I try and make it the month, the third Monday of the month. And it would be around this time because oh, um, now, now I'm in the UK. Uh, and I, what I found is a lot of tea rooms close on the Monday. So even if once you're actually getting into there, it's Monday's a good day. Um, and that way we can um, have these, these sessions and answer any of your immediate questions. And then we can give you some uh, activities to do between now and the next month and then keep you on track. So okay. uh, and then we can I can check in with you and, 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 you know, if you say you found a place and you have a contract, you want me to look through it with you, I can do that review. So it, it just buys in a little bit more of me to help you with your business. So uh, so I say the, the coaching is um, is is pretty good. And 
I don't know if you found it helpful listening to other people's questions and those answers, but it can spark ideas and uh, these little nuggets that you can kind of take away. So, um, so that can be pretty cool too. Um, and then I can just signpost you to what's next if uh, some of the training we've got is relevant. Does that sound good? Excellent. Okay, um, well, let's wrap this up then and uh, I'll get this uh, um, recording. I'll get those out to you. Uh, are you okay if I put this up on the Tea Room Secrets group as well? Um, yep. I don't think there's anything too uh, private in there, but I just want to make sure that people get to know a little bit about what we can do when we're working together rather than being a little silo and on your own and thinking, oh, my God. And, and it does take time to get the confidence going as well. So any little steps that you can do in the meantime, um, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, afternoon teas at home or farmers markets like I did, it just helps to start growing um, your customer base. So anything you can do is all good. OK, so, well, lovely to meet you. I always like to see you put uh, faces to the names that I see popping up every now and again. Uh, so thank you. And uh, maybe we'll see each other again soon. Sounds perfect. Thank you, thank you very much, Tina. OK, thanks now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.